All right, this is part five of Everything Sad is Untrue. I will tell you three stories of my mother, the unstoppable. One, the time she fixed my bloody nose in the secret church. Two, the time she got a bunch of threats. Three, the time she got caught. It goes like this. We got back. The birds of my aviary had all waited for me and they listened to my stories about all the different candy they had in England. The jasmine plants were still the smell of the entire city of Isfahan to me, but that's only because I mostly played in our backyard. Seema, the daughter of an exile and the granddaughter of an exile, came home already knowing her fate. At the time, I told you it was illegal for Muslims to become Christian and more illegal for Christians to preach to Muslims. So she went to Holfa, the city within the city of Isfahan, where the Armenians make cream puffs. They were excused to be Christian because Shah Abbas said so in 1606. That's where my mother met Pastor Pike. Pike was a missionary from the United States, so he had to hide in a room in our house. It was as if Seema brought home a stray cat and said, can we keep him? And my dad said, if the committee finds out, they'll kill all of us. And my mom said, then we'd go to heaven telling people about the truth and saving their souls. And he said, ah, and you can kind of see it from both their sides. My mom had the enthusiasm of somebody who just played Chrono Tiger Trigger for the first time and has to tell everybody about it. The members of the secret church would meet in abandoned buildings. It was just a small group of them, maybe 30 people. Everyone was careful about how they spoke, even to each other, because anyone could be with the committee. They would pray together about the other th about other things, but also that the secret police wouldn't kick the door down at any moment and arrest all of them while they prayed. My sister and I would play in the parking lots outside the little doors to the basements of the abandoned buildings. It was like the Bible studies in Oklahoma. There was nothing ever for us to do. I was a climber and a jumper. She was a finder and an explainer. We hated waiting for gronies to talk about eternity. It seemed so obvious that everything was already eternal, that something made all of it, something that loved and was beautiful and was cosmically and royally ticked off with what everyone was up to. We never walked straight into one of the buildings where we met because it would look suspicious. So my mom would take us to the local grocer at the corner to see, seem like we were walking around the neighborhood doing chores. The grocers had gunny sacks of dates and almonds next to stacks of fruit leather, not orc bars or anything like that. We got little bags of puffed rice, hemp seeds, and roasted chickpeas. If you picked each rice puff by itself and sucked the salt from it and waited till it dissolved in your mouth, then the Bible study would be almost over by the time you finished the bag. I never ate the chickpeas because they were as hard as cherry stones. At this point, I should also tell you I picked my nose a lot back then. Not with oily, salty fingers. I would lick them before. My sister would say, you are disgusting. I would also lick them after. Anyway, one day I was rolling a chickpea in between my fingers. They were almost done. They'd all walked out. They'd all walk out, not together, at different times without looking at us so it didn't catch attention. My sister had already tried to swap her chickpeas for my fruit leather, which was a scam. Now we were walking on a narrow garden wall. She said, you can't tell anyone you know. I know. If you tell anyone, they'll kill mom. I know, I said again. I picked at an itch in my nose with my thumb. That's when I noticed the chickpea fit right inside my nostril. It was snug, and if I blew it out, it made a pleasant pop sound and flew off. I stuck another one in and shot it out at a yellow flower sprouting from the rock wall. You won't even get to see her. They'll just grab her and probably Baba too, and we'll go live with Grandpa Armand. That was my mom's dad, the stern governor, who would never have taken us. Why not Baba Haji? My dad's dad, the poet farmer, the love of my grandmother's life. Because, said my sister, just don't tell anybody. That's when I knew she was lying. If anything happened, of course we'd go to Baba Haji and Mama and Masi in Ardistan. She just wanted me to stay quiet. I tried to shoot another chickpea, but it didn't come out. I breathed in by accident. It went up. They could run in there with guns right now. I put my pinky finger up there because it's the smallest, but it didn't fit behind the chickpea. It just pushed it up further. I stopped walking. If we see a black van, we have to run inside and tell them. The chickpea was so high up in my nose, it was between my eyes. I scratched at it, 
but all it did was turn. When my sister turned around, she screamed. For a second, I thought there was a black van behind me, but she was looking at me. That's when I saw my booger finger was covered in blood, not a little blood. The way my mom describes it, the grown-ups were all huddled together in prayer when the door of the basement slammed open and little Kosi ran inside, weeping with a river of blood pouring from his nose. Everyone startled, like a flock of birds on the sidewalk. They thought for sure the committee men were right behind me with guns and vicious hearts and fists willing to hit a five-year-old. Except my mom. She ran toward me and scooped me up. I was too old to be held, but that didn't stop her. What? 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 She said, what happened? And I remember this part because even though it was hurting now and the blood was rushing out, I was so embarrassed to admit it in front of everybody that I'd stuck a chickpea up my nose. She pinched the bridge of my nose and closed my other nostril and said, blow, and then blow again. On the third blow, a glob of blood and mucus and chickpea went flying out and hit the floor in front of Pastor Pike. Everyone laughed the way you do in a scary movie because they were still imagining the committee men. A couple people stopped coming after that. But no matter how many times her husband lashed Seema with a belt, she believed. You can't make someone stop believing something. In fact, she hung a little cross necklace from the rear view mirror of her car, which was probably a reckless thing to do. But you know, in Oklahoma, after the hundredth time I rode bus 209 and got cut with something, or Brandon Goff ripped my hair out, I understood it. They can't break you. You stick your chin out like, go ahead, hit me if you're going to hit me. My mom was like that. One day after work, she went to her car and there was a note stuck to the windshield. It said, Madam Doctor, if we see this cross again, we'll kill you. To my dad, this is the kind of story that proves his point that Seema was picking a fight, that she could have lived quietly and saved everyone the heartaches that would come if she'd kept her head down, if she stopped telling people, if she pretended just a few holidays a year that nothing had changed, she could still have everything. Seema took the cross down that day. Then she got a cross so big it blocked half the windshield and she put it up. Why would anybody live with their head down? Besides, the only way to stop believing something is to don deny it yourself, to hide it, to act as if it hasn't changed your life. Another way to say it is that everybody is dying and going to die of something. And if you're not spending your life on the stuff you believe, then what are you even doing? What is the point of the whole thing? It's a tough question because most people haven't picked anything worthwhile. A few weeks after that, Seema was in a market buying pomegranates and tea and saffron when a black van pulled up onto the sidewalk. The committee men who looked like regular men got out and grabbed her up. Nobody in the market said anything. The van drove away and disappeared like a bad memory. The grocer probably put back the pant pomegranates and the tea and the saffron so that someone else could buy them. You probably don't know this, but Oklahoma is called Tornado Alley and also the buckle of the Bible Belt, which means it's a great place to hide. You are surrounded by as many Christians in Oklahoma as Muslims in Iran. Cars practically come with the crosses attached. But also Oklahoma gets more tornadoes than anywhere in the world, except it isn't spread over out over all 365 days of a year. They happen in the summer, almost every night, sometimes three or four at a time huge tunnels of wind that claw the earth. Like if God was scratching his belly just above the belt buckle, each finger would be a tornado. Sometimes they erase entire towns off the map. Suddenly your grandpa's house is as gone as to you as mine is to me. When you see a tornado rip swimming pools out of the ground, you realize something Oklahomans already know. People aren't very big. In fact, if you stand in the wide flat expanse of an Oklahoma field, you can watch a rain cloud roll in from miles and miles away, pulling a curtain of rain across the prairie toward you and your little body will collide with less than a trillionth of it. The rain won't even notice. Men who make committees and go around stealing mothers and hurting them, they're just red ants killing black ants in a giant universe that has tornadoes bigger than the biggest thing we have ever built. And that's a nice thought. It's nice to be unimportant. There's a song here that goes, Oklahoma ditches run Oklahoma red when Oklahoma rivers have been overfed with Oklahoma rain from Oklahoma skies and I've still got Oklahoma dirt in my eyes. I think it means we need more than rain to clean us. 
Nobody ever, ever speaks about what happened to my mom when the secret police took her. I don't think they realize that I have seen more than seven rated R Van Damme movies and my imagination is probably worse than what happened. I mean, I don't know, maybe it isn't. Scheherazade never had this problem because she made everything up and she didn't love anyone in her tales. To her, this would be the moment that a young woman, nameless, no kids, was caught up in the lair of a vile jinn. Or, jinn, or if she's lucky, a demon who believes in God. But she isn't lucky, and so we hear the clicking of the monster's teeth and the clacking of his boots. But this is my mom we're talking about. I asked her once about it while she was cooking, so I knew she couldn't go anywhere. She said, Ach, why do you want to know? Ray wasn't around, so she could be herself. I said, I just do, which got me nowhere, so I added, It's for school. She didn't believe me. She kept chopping a mound of herbs the size of a basketball. I went for plan C. Come on, come on, please, just tell me. I can handle it. Did they have bazookas? What's a bazooka? A rocket launcher. Kosru, she said, clicking her tongue. Of course not. Guns? The ones in the van did, but they didn't want to be so obvious. The word she used also means rude. Like Persians are so polite that even the secret police who go around killing people don't want to be so rude as to scare the kids in the market. So they had badges? How did you know they were the committee? She finished with the herbs, scooped them in both hands, and dropped them into the stock pot. All the leaves wilted and shrank until they all disappeared into the broth. She was looking into the pot, but had gone back to the day in Isfahan, you could tell, and was remembering whatever answer there was. We just knew. They looked completely normal, men in corduroy pants and knit caps like your uncle wore. I thought I recognized one of them, and in the van, the one in the front seat turned and said, I'm sorry, Madam Doctor. You knew him? He knew me. Maybe I treated his mother or something. Then what? She didn't say anything. I used the same trick again, where I'd say something so ridiculous she had to correct me. Did you go to prison? No. The torture prison. Even. Even prison? Did they take you? No. Is that where dad went? Kosru. She shushed me like she was embarrassed even though there wasn't anybody around. And besides, he only went for a short time. At first, the government thought he was a big time dealer since he bought more than any person could use for themselves in a year. But really, the giant stash was to throw a party for a whole town, which is so perfectly him. He was just being a good host. Then where, I said, was there a different prison? It wasn't a prison, she said. Then what, I say. Do you see how frustrating this is, by the way? They were all like this. My mom, my dad, even Ray. They hid stories that explained what we were even doing in Oklahoma. Maybe just from me. I don't know. If you're the only person everyone else is keeping from a secret, then you don't know what you don't know. They had houses all over Isfahan, she said. The houses were unmarked and sat in the rows of tense neighborhoods like uncracked knuckles. They lived together, I said. No, no. They lived with their families, maybe just a few houses down. They used the phones to hold that they used the houses to hold people to interrogate them. Is that what they did? It occurred to me at this point that I didn't want to hear this anymore. The one who knew me looked just like your uncle Reza. He had a red beard. He was still very young, very respectful. Why didn't you scream when they took you from the van to the house? No one would do anything. They would pretend they didn't hear. Everyone was scared. She paused. And who would they call anyway? This was the police. So they took her into the house where evil happened next door to all the sweet families. What did it look like? Ah, Kosru, I'm working. I'll help. It's okay. The house was normal. Did it have a TV? No, no, there was no furniture. It took me to an, he took me to an empty room with just one chair in it. Did you sit in it? Eventually. They left you alone? For a while. What did you do? I cried. I prayed. I waited. So it was completely empty. Why didn't you jump out of a window? There were no windows. It was just a box. What about the floor? Could you pull up the floorboards? It's not a Van Ban movie. The floor was cement, she said. Dam. Don't say bad words, Kosru. That's his name, Van Dam. I don't like it. Taste this. It's roasted eggplant with lemon and garlic. Good, I say. When you say bad words, they think you're uneducated. Okay. I sat and waited. 
What were you thinking? I said. I stared at the grate in the floor. The whole room was tilted like a bathtub to a metal drain in the middle. I didn't ask her what it was for because I knew. But in case you don't, it was for blood. The thing is that Scheherazade was telling her stories to a king in the language they both spoke as babies, so she never had to explain the demons who believed in God or what was rude. She just showed it in the story. But the shame of refugees is that we have to constantly explain ourselves. It makes the stories patchworks, not beautiful rugs. Anyway, in Iran, when you go to someone's house, they put out a spread with tea and sweets on a rug and you sit together and the host should offer you the best stuff. The only offering in front of Sima was the drain and the threat of a little river of blood winding its way across the floor toward it. That was why the committee men left her alone in there to look at it. It was like bringing someone a tray of tea and putting a gun on the table next to it. I didn't say anything for a while because she was melting a little butter in the microwave in a mug, adding saffron and then pouring it over the steaming rice. And because I was thinking this is the same person as the one in the story, it's no myth and she's so small. The legend of my mom is that she can't be stopped. Not when you hit her, not when a whole country full of goons puts her in a cage, not even if you make her poor and try to kill her slowly in the little by little poison of sadness. And the legend is true. I think because she fixed her eyes on something beyond the rivers of blood to a beautiful place on the other side. How else would anybody do it? The dinner was finished and she hadn't told me everything that happened. I said, so how did you get out? She closed the oven and put the back of her wrist on her forehead and closed her eyes like she was checking her own temperature. She said, the one who knew me came in finally and said, you can go now. That's it, I said. They had already asked me to tell them the names of everyone in the underground church. Did you? No. So they let you go. He said, please, Madam Doctor, they'll kill you and your kids if you don't tell them. And then they let you go? She nodded. Did he say anything else? That I had one week to think about it. And then you just walked out the door? Nobody saw you? They saw me. You just walked home? I ran to the market to get the car and groceries. We needed dinner. King or queen, queen reader, this is a good place in the story to hold our breath. With Seema in the demon's clutches, running through Isfahan toward a home she knows she can never live in again, and ask a question that relates to this. Would you rather a God who listens or a God who speaks? Be careful with the answer. It's as important as every word from Scheherazade's mouth that saved her life and everybody's got an answer. A God who listens is like your best friend who lets you tell him about all the people you don't like. A God who speaks is like your best teacher who tells Brandon Goff he has to leave the room if he's going to call people falafel monkeys. A God who listens is your mom who lets you sit in a kitchen and tell her stories about castles in the mountains. A God who speaks is your dad who calls on the phone with advice for your life in America. There are gods all over the world who just want you to express yourself. Look inside and find whatever you think you are, and that's all it takes to be good. And there are gods who are so alien to us with minds so clear, the only thing to do would be to sit at their feet and wait for them to speak, to tell us what is good. A God who listens is love. A God who speaks is law. At their worst, the people who want a God who listens are self-centered. They just want to live in the land of do as you please. And the ones who want a God who speaks are cruel. They just want laws and justice to crush everything. I don't have an answer for you. This is the kind of thing you live your whole life thinking about probably. Love is empty without justice. Justice is cruel without love. And sometimes, like Sima, you get neither. Oh, and in case it wasn't obvious, the answer is both. God should be both. If a God isn't, that is no God. Here's what I know about our escape from Iran. Seema had one week to think about it, which meant she had one week to tell the committee men the names of all the people in the underground church. All those people I scared when I ran in with the bloody nose, all dead if the committee got to them. She had one week or they would snatch her again and they would kill us, my sister and me. She had one week to choose. And it wasn't like she could go anywhere. The committee was everywhere, in vans all over the city, neighbors, the daughters of pistachio vendors, the sons of pharmacists, 
I was in kindergarten, remember. I only have a vague picture of a room lying down on a carpet in rows with other kids like me for nap time. And I remember once sitting at a table for school lunch and hearing my teacher say, ooh, like a happy bird and looking back and seeing my dad in a big coat. He bought kebab for the whole school. Maybe it was my birthday. I don't remember that part, but even the teachers got some. The best kebab in Isfahan with buttered rice and roasted tomatoes. We all got to eat it. Nobody was too poor or anything like that. My dad would pick me up from school in his gold Chevrolet. That day we got home and my mom was flying around the house like a bird in a panic. My dad thought she had finally gone crazy. She was shouting things we couldn't understand, stripping pictures out of a photo album and throwing them into a suitcase. When my dad grabbed her by the shoulder, she looked at him like a scared bull, like he was a committee man. And he let go like she was on fire. He said, tell me. And I don't remember more because they spoke in the bedroom. I went to my room and got Mr. Sheep Sheep. If we had to go anywhere, he would be my first choice because I was his shepherd and he was my number one friend. After that, I stuffed my pockets full of auric bars from the toys clown's pants on my desk. Remember, there were more in the bus-shaped cushion, but I thought I would save those for when we came back. And then I remembered my Atari, which was my number one toy. I am told that from here out on out in the story, my grandpa Armand, the severe, was present. But like I told you, I don't remember him there. Maybe like a gin, he found a little corner of the stories to hide in. I don't know. The story goes that we all got in the car and drove to the airport, even though we would probably be followed by the committee men. And the moment we gave our passports to the soldiers at the gate, a giant red alarm would go off and everyone would be arrested. Don't you have to have papers and stuff? I once asked when we were safe in Oklahoma. And my mom said, we did. That same day? No, a couple days later. I imagined it all in one day, one big chase scene, but my mom says I went to sleep that night in my own bed, holding Mr. Sheep Sheep until my grandpa Armand could come help. When my mom describes it all, she skips over the interrogation and the panic and says it was a time of three miracles. Three things that could have happened, couldn't have happened without the intervention of angels. This is the part that the pastors of Oklahoma churches love the best and ask her to repeat as often as possible for their congregations. And when I told it to Mrs. Miller's class, I did the same as her because this is her story. And if she says it was miracles, then it was miracles. That's crazy, said Jared. Jared, said Mrs. Miller. He's just making it all up, said Jared. But why would I make up miracles about paperwork? Why wouldn't I tell you it was like Faranak? taking Faradun into the Albor's mountains. There's a real proper legend that everybody knows, and they'd think I was cool if I was like that. If you're going to make it all up, you'd make it so you were the hero. It'd be like, yo, this part of the story, I was the hero, Faradun. Put your head down, Jared. I'm not taking questions right now. And people would be like, that's cool. Because it is cool. Faradun was a stud Finnegans, who was so cool that the evil king dreamed he was walking toward him with a hammer to destroy him. So the king tried to kill Faradun where he, when he, while he was just a kid. Faradun's mom had to take him out of the country. And for a while, she gave him to a rainbow-colored cow to give him super milk while she was away. Then he grew up into a man with shoulders so broad and a brain so fast that he could only ever be a king. And in fact, in Persia, they would say King Faradun shined with the light of greatness and wisdom and people would have to cover their eyes when they saw him, which is where salutes come from. And Jared, always Jared, he'd say, like military salutes? And I'd say, yes, the salute is a Persian symbol for shielding your eyes from the light of greatness when a boss comes in the room. Then Kelly would say, your story is kind of like that since you had to escape with your mother from an angry king. And I would nod and say, except for the rainbow cow part, yes. And the whole class would stand up and give me a salute and I would salute them back. We would all salute and then play together at recess. That's how you know I'm telling the truth because I didn't get the salutes for telling a good sounding version. I just said what happened, which is that my mom says we saw three full on miracles. And even though everybody was willing to believe a rainbow cow story, for some reason, they won't believe miracles when they happen in offices and airports.
And anyway, the miracles were these. One, the papers, two, the police, and three, the plane. It was New Year's, which is a two-week holiday, and nobody could get the papers to leave the country. And even if they could, we couldn't because the secret police would have stopped it. So even though my mom had panic packed a suitcase and screamed at my dad who had insisted there was nothing wrong and it would all blow over, even though she said it wouldn't blow over unless she gave the names of the church and he'd said, so maybe, and she growled something and he'd given up. Even with all that, they still couldn't do anything because they didn't have the papers. We were all dead. The end. Oklahoma never happened, except that afternoon, my dad got a call, a dental emergency, a miracle tooth. I told you already he was the best dentist in Isfahan. Well, it just so happened that a minister of immigration, a mullah, a boss man in the government, had taken an eager bite of a peach and broke his left front tooth on the stone. The sticky juice was still in his beard, so my dad reached in to fix it. It was like the story of the mouse pulling a thorn from the paw of the lion, except my dad is the lion and the mullah is a toad. But we lived in the land of the toads and needed toad papers. That's how we got them. If it had gone any other way, we'd be dead. The mullah goes for a pomegranate, we're dead. My dad is the second favorite dentist in the city, we're dead. But everything went all right and we all piled into the car. I imagined I imagine my mom as she crossed the street with her suitcase, looking in both directions for an unmarked van parked somewhere. I didn't know we'd never see our birds again, or I would have said goodbye. I would have maybe gotten a sprig of jasmine from the yard and kept it in my pocket. I don't know. Maybe I'd have gotten one of my dad's shirts, anything. But I had Mr. Sheep Sheep and a pocket full of work bars. In the car, my dad drove like a mouse, scurrying down side streets to avoid any people we knew. He said, is there any food? No one said anything, so I held out an auric bar. My son, he said, which was like saying, my great son, thank you. My sister hit my elbow and said, I want one. So I gave her one and another for my mom because at this time she was my favorite and she'd feel left out. I ate the last one and that was the last auric bar I ever tasted. If you want a God who listens, maybe all you want is pity for losing your only friend, like Mr. Sheep Sheep. If you want a God who speaks, maybe all you want is revenge. I'll get to the other two miracles. For now, we're standing in a brush field beside a parking lot, my mom, my sister, my dad, and me. I'm standing a little farther out and staring. I'm staring nervously at the tall grass swaying above my head and holding Mr. Sheep Sheep. There are no trees in the field. In the distance, the airplanes come and go. There is no place to hide for a baby sheep. The gronies are staring at me, then looking at each other in code. I'm standing a bit away from them. I take another step back, clutching my friend tighter. I'm wearing my corduroy pants and a plaid shirt. That's what shepherds wear. My dad is wringing sweat from his mustache. He clicks his tongue to hurry this ceremony along. My sister, who never loved sheep, sighs. My mom doesn't want to force me. She kneels down and looks in my eyes. Her eyes are big and black and very, very sad. Baby June, she says to me, it's time to set him free. I don't think any shepherd has done this kind of thing before, but Mr. Sheep Sheep is a sheep. And I, am I the only one who can say he's a sheep? You don't set sheep free, they're your friends. It's unthinkable. Little sheep left in the wild are carcasses. Every story tells us so. Baby sheep, lost in the woods, must immediately search for their mothers. No distractions from strangers. Sheep wandering around alone in parking lots, like this one, would die. They would lose their lives. Wolves walking down the mountains into the dry, thinning scalp of the middle of Iran would be looking for juicy sheep. For the long journey across the dry lands, Allah would provide, they would think. And they'd pounce when they saw him. They'd crunch all the buttons of his eyes for the nutrients. They'd slurp all the stitching thread of his mouth and nose. I don't want to do this. My mom's eyes dart to every vehicle in the distance. And we're not coming back for him, I say? No, she says. I remember looking at my dad and realizing this is news to him too, that we're never coming back. His eyes grow wide and begful. His mustache becomes a red, unhappy cut across his mouth. This is the look of sadness that I imagine on his face when we speak on the phone. 
My sister is reciting fairy tales and patriotic songs since the grown-ups haven't been paying her attention. Our dad picks her up and she stops. Let's go, she says, but we can't go until we free Mr. Sheep Sheep. If we went into the airport with him, they would take him at the security checkpoint and cut him open with a knife. I didn't know this at the time, but they told me in Oklahoma. They would cut his throat and look inside the stuffing for illegal drugs, which is a cruel and ridiculous thing to do. If my family wanted to smuggle anything, we just make custom linings for a luggage set. If they cut Mr. Sheep Sheep like the bull, there would be no river of blood except for the one pouring from a small exploded heart in my chest. If you can believe a little kid like me could just fall over dead, then believe it here. So we can't go into the airport and we can't carry out, uh, stay outside because the committee men would be following us. Any second, they might peek through the window of our house, see nobody home and realize what happened. We stand in the tall grass and I clutch my stuffed friend. My dad eyes a van driving slowly across the lot and says, we have to go. The committee men would have killed us in the field if they found us. I look at my sister. She smiles at me, the reassuring smile of an older sibling. Then she drags her thumb across her throat and points at Mr. Sheep Sheep, the same smile stitched on her face. I wrench my eyes upward without tilting my head, my strategy for holding back tears. My pupils roll back. My mom shaking her head saying, absolutely not. It will break his heart, my mom says. I don't know what she's talking about, only that after being friends with him my whole life, I'm supposed to leave Mr. Sheep Sheep to die. My mom has the one suitcase. There are no toys in it. Maybe we could hide him somehow? I'm crying at this point and have no idea why the world has to be like this. And then I realize something, something I hadn't noticed. My dad doesn't have a bag with him. He's leaving me at the airport. I'm his Mr. Sheep Sheep, and he's going to send me somewhere I don't even know without him. I put down Mr. Sheep Sheep. He props up on the dirt on a flat panel bottom. His stubby round legs poke out in front of him. His arms reach out for a hug. I look in his black button eyes. They beg. I turn my back and my mom sweeps me up in her arms. My chin bounces on her shoulder as she begins to run. I wave goodbye to my friend. He won't live past sundown, I think. That was the third creature I ever killed. The other two miracles were later at the airport, but I don't remember them firsthand. So here's what my dad said when I asked him one Sunday from Oklahoma. Is that what she told you? Yeah. They weren't miracles, he said. Tell me anyway. There's no such thing as miracles, Kosru. Okay, whatever. Only science, only poetry, only the mind. So at the airport. And the mind can do anything. It can create anything. It is God, Kosru. The mind is God. That's blasphemy, Dad. So what? It's bl uh, So I'm blasphemous. What more can happen? People could be listening. You can hear them sometimes. The American secret police, the CIA, tapping into our calls to listen. Sometimes we hear them cough. Let them listen, he says. Let them hear how all this talk of God ruined my life and took my family. He's crying now. I think it's probably midnight in Isfahan. He's sitting in the dark, empty house. The birds in the walls are probably asleep. Or maybe he opened the windows and let them free for a long time ago. I don't know. I wait for him to finish. Here in Oklahoma, the sun is up. We're not even looking at the same sky or anything cheesy like that. We're in different worlds. He's calling from the land of stories and genies. I'm in the land of concrete and weathermen. Or maybe I'm in the new world, free and full of adventure. And he is in the dying city, crumbling into dust like an elemental fiend. It doesn't matter. They're far apart. How did you get past security, I ask? Why didn't the committee put big red flags on our passports? Accident, he says. Accident, I say. Complete accident. We would have set off all the alarms, big red lights, the second he scanned the passports. Your mom was praying the whole time. What were you doing? slipping money in between the papers. How much? Enough to buy an auric factory? So you just paid off the guard? No, that wouldn't be an accident. That's how the world works every day. We got to the front of the line. Your mother was mumbling. The guard had a mullah's beard. So? So he was religious. Everybody was insane but me. He wouldn't take any amount of money. So you take out the cash? Did you take out the cash so he wouldn't be insulted? I tried. 
If he saw it, he'd be furious. And then what? I nudged your mother forward so I could sneak it out. She was so scared. It was a terrible week for her. She just said, please. Then what? I said, ach, wait a minute. I'm telling you. She said, please. And then your grandfather, Armand, came running, holding your sister. He said, Seema, Seema, your son is missing. Me? You, you son of a dog. Armand told us he took you into the duty-free shop. The toys were over on the other side of the security gate, and so you must have wandered over there. I was probably looking for Mr. Sheep Sheep. Yeah, said my dad. He thought the story was cute, I should say. He liked to tell stories about how difficult I was, peeing in luggage stores and running off in airports, because that's what dads who get to be with their sons every day do. They complain about it instead of begging God to bring them back and pretending they were little angels. You were off being a little goat pellet, but your mother heard this and started sobbing. She almost fell, but we caught her and the guard said, go, go find your son. And so he waved us through. If he hadn't, we'd all be dead. Did it take long to find me? You know, you were right in front of the candy shop. The woman gave you a chocolate and you followed her around like a piglet. We scooped you up and ran to the terminal. It's weird. I even asked my mom if her dad had made it all up, but she said no. He would never embarrass himself like that. It was as if I disappeared for 10 minutes. What was the third miracle? I asked my dad. There weren't any planes. We didn't have any tickets. Did you find tickets on the floor or something? One flight going to Dubai had some kind of leak, so they landed in Iran first for repairs. Totally unscheduled. How did we get in? Money. But it was totally random that the plane was there? Yep. Wow. Yeah, he said, kind of dumbfounded about it. It's really nuts, I said. Your mom's had more miracles than I've had hot food. Then we didn't say anything for a while. I mean, you don't have to believe any of it, and I wouldn't blame you. But if there were accidents, then it was like putting a jigsaw puzzle into a tumble dryer and having it come out with all the pieces in the right place. You know why I told you all those poop stories? Because food and poop are the truest things about you. I walked past the bathroom once when Kelly J was walking out and the smell was so foul and sour, it was like she could have never, she could never hide her rotten insides, no matter how pretty she is. Jared S is rich, but his mom feel, feeds him bread I wouldn't give to the ducks and meat they color pink with chemicals, like he isn't even welcome in his own house. So I feel bad for him. We all have our own pain. You can't trick people when it comes to food or poop. If you give them bad food, they get sick. If they have blood in their toilets, something is wrong. They have a disease or something, or somebody kicked them in the stomach a lot. If you give them sugar, they get excited and then crash. Their bodies expose the lie. There are no myths or legends that can trick you by the time that you've put something in your mouth and you're digesting it. Even though people tell me I'm poor, my mom makes the best food in the world. And they tell me I smell, but I saw after Jim that they had skid marks on their underwear, which is poop that didn't wipe away with the dry paper. They soil themselves every day instead of washing. Anyway, I also told you, told you all that because I don't want you to think I'm some dingleberry weak stick whose mama is so gross that people don't even want to eat next to me. And I have a food and poop story about Ray. First, the story. One night really late, so late it was early, I was reading the part where Sam the Hobbit sees Gandalf come back and it's like seeing his grandpa return from the land of death and memories. And his grandpa laughed, and it says it sounded like water in a parched land. I could imagine exactly what the feeling must have been like, but not what it was. Does that make sense? And Sam thinks maybe all the sad parts of the adventure will come untrue now that this one has, and the beautiful part is that they do. Outside my room, the rain and hail were smashing into our windows. In Oklahoma, rain can sound like the gallop of horses come to your rescue or the laughter of darkness. It was late summer when tornadoes ride up and down the state every night like wraiths and sometimes attack the towns looking for hobbits who are really just kids. I had a kuliche, which is a bready cookie stuffed with cinnamon and walnut, which is exactly like the lempus bread that the elves make, which means maybe J.R.R. Tolkien had Persian friends. If you ever read the books, that really is the best part. Ray opened the door without knocking. Daniel, get up, he said. Why are you wearing a trash bag, I said. 
Your mom thinks it's safer. Why are you crying? I'm not. I wiped my eyes away. I was reading. My eyes are red. It's two in the morning. I didn't tell him I was at the best part. Do you know how much I would have had to explain about hobbits and lembas bread and wizards who hold your cheeks in their hands and pour love into you? A lot. And what would he care? The only dad he ever had tied him to a tree. He threw a black trash bag at me and said, come on, put on your shoes. I followed him through the dark house. My mom was waiting by the door. She helped me pull the trash bag over my head after I tore holes in it so I could wear it like a poncho. Be careful, she said. Ray sucked his teeth like she was babying me. I put on my shoes. Outside, the hail sounded like clacking teeth. Before he opened the door, Ray turned around and handed me a box of three-inch nails. Don't drop these. There's a sarcastic phrase in Farsi that goes, good thing you told me, because I would have done it otherwise. I didn't say it, but it would have been the moment to say it. Why would I choose to drop them? Stepping outside during a tornado or even a storm on the outskirts of a tornado is a pig idiot thing to do that no one real Oklahoman would do. Tornadoes are tunnels of wind half a mile wide that pick up cars and fling them three towns over. If you have a barn and it's still standing in the morning, it'll have rocks and keys and bolts embedded in the wood like they were shot from cannon. Every kid knows you run inside when a tornado comes. Find the thickest pipe that goes the deepest underground like the one in your bathtub. Get in, put a blanket over you, and pray to, God, to a God that listens. We know this because Oklahoma has more tornadoes than anywhere on earth. If you're keeping up, that means... They don't just have a God who listens or a God who speaks, but a God who puts his finger in the dirt and swirls it. Anyway, if the tornadoes don't suck the air out of your lungs and toss you like a rag doll, and if the swarm of nails doesn't go through you like shotgun pellets, there's still the sheet lightning. As I followed Ray outside, a giant web of lightning appeared in the sky like a crack in a glass and lit up the neighborhood as bright as daytime for half a second. I didn't even have time to start counting before the thunder exploded over our heads. Another bad move is to go climbing a tall metal ladder in the middle of a thunderstorm when lightning is looking for just two kinds of things to strike, tall things and metal things. I don't know if Ray had to shout because of the hail or because he didn't think I was listening. Take this, he shoved a hammer into my chest, and hit the corners. Watch what I do. I still didn't know what he was talking about. I'd been in a hobbit glade like three minutes ago, so he probably thought I was scared. Don't be weak, he said. Then he ran out from under the front door into the storm. I followed. Immediately, everything about me was soaked. The poncho was useless. Ray ran to the ladder, propped against the house, and started climbing. I stuffed the hammer in my sweatpants pocket and followed him up. The wind was waiting for me to clear the roof line. When I did it, it smashed into me and almost sent me sailing backward. Ray grabbed me by the poncho and shirt and chest skin and pulled me down so I wasn't just such a big target. It's hard to look around in rain and hail that punches at you sideways when you're on your hands and knees. It's not weak to squint your eyes. The storm was ripping the roof tiles clean off the house. There was nothing to hold on to. I played a sumo game with the wind. The only light was lightning. Go, said Ray. If it gets under the shingles, it'll flood the house. He grabbed some nails from the box I was holding and started pounding them into the corners of the tiles. I put the box down beside me and took a nail. You have to do a bunch of things with your hands if you're trying to nail shingles down in the middle of a tornado. One, hold down the flapping corner of the shingle. Two, hold the nail on the right part. Three, hit the nail with the hammer. That's already three, and you only have two hands. And don't forget, you have to hang on to the roof for dear life. So I pounded the nail in, in four hits, which isn't great, but not bad, and went to get another nail. At the same time, Ray reached out for more nails. I told you already, I put the box beside me. In case you ever do something like this, don't put anything down beside you. The box had slid off. Ray said, Good thing I told you not to drop them in Farsi, which is when I remembered the phrase is for when you warn someone about something and they do it anyway. That was when I realized I had to write down the memories and myths and legends and even the phrases and jokes or I'd lose everything, maybe even the recipes. But first I had to climb back down the ladder. My mom stuck her head out the window and said, be careful. I dug the nails out of the bushes and went back up. 
Ray had another box of nails anyway. He just wanted to keep it closed so he could return it to the store if we didn't use it. I pounded nails into flappy shingles for another half hour and didn't talk to Ray. I thought my grandfather's house is 600 years old and made of stone. I cried. Dear reader, you have to understand the point of all these stories, what they add up to. Scheherazade was trying to make the king human again. She made him love life by showing him all of it, the funny parts about poop, the dangerous parts with demons, even the boring parts about what makes marriages last. Little by little, he began to feel the joy and sadness of others. He became less immune, less numb because of the stories. And what about you? You might feel what I felt on the roof that night. I was ashamed of being so weak, angry at Ray for everything he'd done, tired of being poor, and afraid of the thunder and lightning crashing all around me. I thought of my Baba Haji as I braced against the roof of the house. I prayed to God I would see him again. It won't be in this life, so it has to be wherever God puts us. I prayed that even though I was Christian and he was whatever he was, I prayed that God would still let him hold me once we're both dead. Reader, I think he heard me. I think he's a God who listens as if we are his most important children, and I think he speaks to tell us so. I looked up. The hail left felt like nails. It didn't matter. I opened my mouth. Ray said something. I don't know what. I was busy eating the tornado. The next day in class, Mrs. Miller didn't even ask us what we did during the storm because Oklahoma people know that you shouldn't do anything. Instead, she said, today I want you to write about the strongest smell you ever experienced. But I already told the class about the wall of jasmine flowers in the garden of the house with the birds in the walls. So when it was my turn, I read aloud. The strongest smell I ever smelled was last summer when I dug out a poop trench, she sighed. What's a poop trench, said Jared S. That is so gross, said Kelly J. I can't, I can't be here. I said, our to toilet was broken, so my stepdad made me dig trenches in the backyard to find where the pipes had split open. Sit down, Kelly, said Mrs. Miller. I have to go, said Kelly. Can I be excused? How much did he pay you, said Jared. He didn't. I would have told him no, said Jared. I doubt it, Jared. One day, Ray told me to come outside, and I thought he was going to yell at me for mowing too close to the house and cutting the tulips, but he gave me the shovel and said, dig. Why? Don't ask why. How big? Till I tell you. I put the tip of the shovel into the grass and stomped on the lip. It only went in about a quarter of the way. Ray sucked his teeth. But digging is the kind of thing you can't do when people are watching. I kicked again, and the shovel got halfway down. When I pulled it back, the grass made a tearing sound, and underneath was a clump of red Oklahoma dirt. I was going too slow, so Ray grabbed another shovel and punched it into the dirt in front of mine. He stomped it in with one try, like this, he said, which was worse than not helping at all. We both dug, with him doing double fast to embarrass me into doing it better till we had a hole big enough to fit a cocker spaniel. Then he said, he stopped and said, that's not it. Start one over here. Around the fifth hole, I got the same level deep. When I stomped, the shovel slipped all the way in and my foot sank a bit into mud, but it wasn't mud. And the smell rose up with it of about five months worth of flushes for our whole family. I pulled my shoe out with a schlorpy sound. How can I help you understand the smell? What myth do we share that I can reference to make you feel the power? Have you ever walked into an overloaded porta potty? Have you ever felt your tongue retreat back into your mouth? Do you know why it does that? Because all smell is particulate. That means little bits of poop wafting in the air have gone into your nose and down your throat and your body is telling you, whatever you do, don't eat anymore. So you gag. Your mouth opens and you get a real heave going and swallow another wave of rancid smell. And that's when I bent over and puked right into the trench. Ray said, ah, come on. And he jumped away. About five feet under the trench, the pipe going to our house must have burst and turned all the surrounding dirt into sewage. Ray threw down his shovel and said, clear out around the pipe. And he left. The trench he wanted me to dig had to be big enough to fit a refrigerator. 
I threw up two more times and shoveled my puke out as I went. When I finished, it was almost sundown and Ray reached down to lift me out of the hole, but I didn't take his hand, even though I had to put my own hand in the slop to hoist myself up. I wasn't mad. I just didn't want his help. To know the truth about yourself, you have to know if you can eat tornadoes for food and shovel a mountain of poop. So when Kelly J sees your lunch and says it smells gross, or Brandon Goff says you're, you calls you a dirty monkey, then you can think you don't know anything about what food is and where poop goes. They may not, that might not sound like a lot, but it's a true thing in a world without many true things. The only lie was that the poop trench wasn't the strongest smell I ever smelled. It wasn't even the worst smell. A worse smell than all of that is opium. Opium is a smell I can't and won't describe. Instead, imagine the smell of flowers, but sweeter and with broken glass in it. That's my next memory after Mr. Sheep Sheep because I don't remember the airport or sneaking into the plane. When I say we snuck into a plane, you probably conjure up whatever plane you saw last. Maybe you imagine a dude from the grounds crew with a mustache and those orange ear protectors counting a wad of cash at the bottom of the stairs. Then you see a little Persian woman with two scared kids stepping onto a into the narrow cabin in the back. Maybe the lady making announcements scowls at them. Maybe she because she's no smuggler and because there are no seats and they'll have to stand in the back when they make coffee where they make coffee. I don't even remember the moment my dad left us or let us go. However you want to say it. I don't have a picture for him kneeling down and looking me in the eye or a hug. I don't know. Wouldn't you cry if you lost your family? I wasn't ugly then and no one thought I smelled weird. I was his son and maybe he was all torn up about it. It's the not remembering that makes it one giant hole in the middle of a rug like someone didn't even care to address it. On one line, you've got a dad who laughs and brings you candy bars and checks your teeth. And on the next line, blank. Maybe it was all in a hurry on the run from the committee men and he had to push us into the plane without much ceremony. I don't know. I don't know. That's the point. When you ask, they never quite tell you. Like in the legend of Zal, when he says to his dad, how can you contemplate leaving me of the world's flowers? My share is only thorns. His father gives the most Persian answer in the world. He says, it's good to express your heart. And then starts talking about his own troubles. That's me. That's how it goes. Anyway, my next memory is the dark streets in Dubai at midnight, where we didn't have a home or know anybody or speak the language. Behind us was the airport. We had the one German suitcase, my mom, my sister, and I. We didn't know where to go because this wasn't a vacation. We hadn't even known we would be in this particular country until just before we got on the plane. My mom said, don't be scared, which was the first time I thought maybe I should be scared. The street I remember was completely deserted. Everyone from the plane had jumped into a car and driven off. We walked and continued to walk until we had left the lights of the airport behind. I feel like I should tell you that it was a very clean street, like a street in a video game, brand new, no cracks in the sidewalk, no litter anywhere. If you ever see someplace like that, it's very noticeable because everybody is used to a bit of dirt or candy wrappers or something but this street was dark and quiet and brand new. I think my mom was hoping there would be a hotel. I remember saying, where are we going? And my mom saying, I don't know. And that was the second time I thought I should be scared. We didn't have any place to sleep. We were homeless, I guess. But then, and this is a miraculous part, we're walking down the cartoon street when a light approaches behind us. We turn around and see the biggest stretch limousine you can imagine. So big, I don't even know how it turned into it the street. Stay close, my mom said. The limo drove up beside us. The door opened and a giant with one cycloptic eyebrow stepped out. He was so big, his mama must have worn hula hoops for bracelets. Under one arm, he had a rifle. I'm not a little kid anymore, so I know it was an AK-47. Oh, and he had sunglasses at night. He got out and stood by the open door of the limo. We stood frozen in front of him because of obvious reasons. There was still nobody in the dark street, like it was all a dream where you forget to fill out the background or in Final Fantasy where the whole world recedes and it's just you and the bad guy in a space like an empty page. 
We didn't know if he was a bad guy. Get in, he said. We got in. I realized because Jared S. said so that I never explained Dubai, which is like saying explain Canada, but whatever, I'll try. Of course, then everybody says my reports are boring or they don't say it, they just sigh like a Jennifer, even though it's kind of like if you went to Iran and tried to explain Oklahoma football and the people said, wait, what's Oklahoma? And you'd say a state. And the other people said, what's a state? And you never even got to the football part but I'll be quick. Dubai is a city in the United Arab Emirates. That's a country on the Persian Gulf. It's actually made of seven emirates, which are like states, but more like principalities because they're owned by seven princes called emirs. That's why they're called emirates. All seven emirates are only as big as half of Oklahoma, but the UAE is one of the richest countries in the world. They have a mall that sells nothing but gold. Every store, floor to ceiling, gold. It's so hot there that swimming pools boil. So one emir built himself an indoor ski resort. It's a giant building with a ski slope covered in snow and giant fans on full blast to keep the air cold. They have castles like in the movie Aladdin. The streets are so clean because the fine for littering is a ton of money and a flogging. The whole country is a prince's private property. I mention that because when we got into the limo, the giant with the gun closed the door and went to sit in the front, and we found ourselves sitting across from a man with a thin black beard, smoking a hookah pipe with long fingers laced with gold rings. He seemed far away and mild, the way you might imagine a king would be if he had nothing to worry about. My mom spoke to him in a bunch of languages till they found one they both liked. On the, neck, on the tray next to his pipe was a plate of a pistachio cookies. My sister whispered to me, he's the prince. I thought that must be good. They must be good cookies then. I reached for one. My, my mom said, Kosru, and I sat down. The prince laughed. You might be wondering why he found us in the street and invited us into his limo. Well, remember those friends of my dad's I mentioned, the ones he visited in London? Legend has it that my dad knew these people and nobody knew that he knew these people. He called a great prince of Dubai with his mythic charm and told him our situation. So here the prince came, like the eagles in the hobbit, swooping in at the darkest hour to save us. That's what I thought, anyway, as we rode in the sweet-smelling car through the garden estate of the emir, past marble beds full of black tulips to his castle by the sea. I hadn't seen Aladdin yet, but when I got to Oklahoma years later, it was the references I had to explain this part to people. The palace towers weren't so round as the ones in the movie, and the real castle had helicopters, but it was all close enough. We stepped out of the limo in the moonlit courtyard. The dry heat felt like a school bus passing by your face. The giant led us into a door along the side. The prince went somewhere else. At this time, I remember thinking, are we rich now? I was just a kid, remember. We entered the kind of room they only have in museums, vaulted ceilings, paintings on the walls, but even I knew the most valuable thing there, maybe the most valuable thing I've ever heard of, was the one massive Persian rug, the size of half a football field laid out across the floor. It was so big, I couldn't even imagine the loom that must have made it. I imagined the carpet hanging like the sail of a ship from two wooden masts and my grandma slowly making each knot. It would have taken as long as she was alive, I thought. I realized at that moment I would never see her again. For me, she would forever be a mythic weaver in the basement of an ancient house in Artistan. She's there now. I'm here in Oklahoma where rugs don't matter to anybody. That's the end of it. There are no magic rugs to fly me to her. There are only shag carpets for rich Oklahomans and million dollar rugs for princes. And the refugees are lucky if they get quilted toilet paper. Believe me, even when I thought we were going to live in the marble palace, I would have given it up to sit in that basement dirt floor again. But anyway, it was a grand ballroom and 20 women in black burkas swept back and forth, placing trays of food enough to cover the rug and feed a thousand people. They didn't say anything to us or to each other. The trays were piled high with saffron rice with grilled tomatoes, ground beef kebabs, filet kebabs, chicken and lamb, yogurt with cucumber and dill, fresh spring onions, purple basil, radishes, pickled vegetables, and a whole grilled fish with garlic. 
imagine half a football field of food and there was more coming until the prince entered the room and the women in the burkas shuffled out in silence they kept their heads down and wouldn't look at us are they going to eat i said shh said my sister sit please said the prince we sat at the far corner of the carpet and put some food on our plates from the trays closest to us the prince sat on the opposite end my mom and the prince spoke some more but we didn't hear it i asked what are they saying don't spill anything said my sister what happens to the food i said his wives eat it after in a different room if you want to know the truth that was all the information i got before the prince stood up put his hand on his heart as a kind gesture to us bowed a little to my mom and excused himself we were alone with all the food and the rug in the palace what happened i said nothing my mom said trying to smile eat I didn't know at the time what had happened, but it was clear that we were no longer welcome in the palace. I stuffed more kebab into my mouth and some yogurt mixed with rice and a pickled cauliflower and used the basil to shove it all in with my fingers. Are we staying here? said my sister. No. Then we left. An hour later, we were back in the street, homeless again.